Hi, everyone. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving, and I hope things are looking great for the week that's coming up. So uh, today we want to look at interwar advertising. So this would be the period in the 1920s and 30s. And I want to start with the concept of capitalist realism. And this is a term that comes from Roland Marchand's reading for this week. It's a chapter in his book called Advertising the American Dream. And um, in the chapter, he, he, he looks at the term capitalist realism, which is a, a, a term that he didn't invent. He got that from a, a sociologist named Michael Schutzen. And in the, um, uh, in the chapter, he talks about the way that capitalist realism is perhaps a, a good way to organize advertisements, to sort of thematically organize them and get a better understanding of what advertising is trying to do. And so capitalist realism is a kind of a, a riff on a far more commonly known term called socialist realism. And socialist realism was an art form that started developing in the 1920s, uh, first in the, uh, the Soviet Union. So it, it comes after the Russian Revolution of 1917 and the formation of the Soviet Union. This was the first communist state that came into being in the world in 1917, 1918. And essentially, it's, a, it's an art form that's meant to sort of advance state interests. So in this case, to advance the interests of the, uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and it's very much a kind of politicized art form in that sense. It, um, it, but it's not just glorifying the state. It's, a form, it's an art form that actually works to glorify ordinary workers. And it um, depicts um, ordinary workers, the downtrodden, the, the proletariat, and it depicts them in glorified terms in kind of very evocative and sometimes very emotionally charged terms, um, very positive portrayals. And it also depicts them in terms of a struggle, right? A struggle for emancipation, emancipation, a struggle to sort of free themselves from the shackles of capitalism and ultimately to be able to form a, a socialist state in which uh, workers are, are the dominant, play the dominant role in the, the government. So that's essentially an art form that comes out of the birth of the Soviet Union in the 1920s, and it's called socialist realism. And I'm just gonna show you a few examples of this type of art. Um, this, uh, this is from uh, a very famous socialist realist artist, Diego Rivera, who actually worked in Mexico and even did some works in the United States. And um, what, what he's depicting here, as you can see, uh, especially on the right, uh, is uh, a picture of these workers who have now sort of taken up arms, and you can see the, the, the hammer and sickle Soviet flag there, taken up arms to sort of uh, bring about their, their emancipation. Um, and so that's uh, one example. The one on the left is more a depiction of of workers in the fields. And, and that one is less perhaps of a glorification of work than perhaps this one is here on the right, on the, on the left. So you can see here, you have these workers um, at a blast furnace. I mean, they're, in theory, they're supposed to be making steel, but they're not doing it with any protective clothing, right? It sort of highlights their, their bravery and, and their kind of machismo in that realm. And here are some more examples of this. These are works um, which uh, come from Helios Gomez, again, another uh, Latin American artist. And you can see here, these are the, uh, uh, the workers who have now taken out arms uh, on the left, and they're marching towards some, some, kind, of a, some kind of a goal or some kind of a, an outcome. And then you see actual examples of ordinary workers who've taken out arms fighting against against uh, the powers of, of capitalism. So those are that's the kind of art form that constituted socialist realism. It was a way to sort of glorify work and workers and the righteousness of ordinary people, ordinary workers, the proletariat. And it was a, 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 an art with a kind of political message as well to sort of help mobilize and galvanize the working classes and get them to think about themselves both as a class, but also as a group of people that could actually um, realize political change by taking, taking control of things. So Marchand 
um, starts with this premise. Well, what if we were to flip it on its head and take Schutzen's term and think about advertising as a form of capitalist realism? So not socialist realism, but um, an art form, the ads themselves as a kind of art form that is very much sort of um, glorifying people, not in their capacities as workers, but in their capacities as consumers. And, and the way that you depict those people as consumers is also very much kind of aspirational and kind of glorifying of them in that capacity. It's not necessarily showing the, ho the ho-hum average everyday aspects of consumerism, but the kind of sense of, of aspirational zeal and um, the kind of benefits that one can gain in their lifestyle, etc., that can come from consumption. So I want to talk about that term. And I'm going to, a little bit later, we'll talk about the way you understand advertising as historical evidence, the way that Marchand sort of grapples with that. And, and then we're going to talk about the concept of the Zerspiegel and the way that Marchand uses that as, as well. Okay, so the way of thinking about advertising as capitalist realism is to think about what advertising primarily does in terms of the way it depicts people and goods and ads. And in that sense, um, one of the things that he found, and this is somebody, Marshan, who, who looked at about 100,000 ads in terms of his book that dealt with the 1920s and 30s. So primarily magazine ads. And he looked at all these ads and was trying to figure out ways to uh, thematically organize them and to come up with sort of concepts that can help us understand what advertising uh, is primarily doing in an aggregate sense. And so he, he um, very early on came to realize that advertisements were f largely about portraying people in an aspirational sense, in an idealized sense, and not depicting the kind of ordinary everyday circumstances of people. And related to that was his understanding that advertisements, and again, he's looking at 100,000 of them. Uh, what he found was that it was surprising how many things that would have been commonplace in people's lives were rarely depicted in advertising. So for example, religious services, right? Going to church or whatever. At this time, well over half of Americans and, and even Canadians would have been regular churchgoers, regular sort of um, adherents to uh, whatever kind of religious services they would have followed. And what he found was that uh, that was rarely depicted in advertising. Even, at, even advertising that was trying to sort of show what ordinary people were about would rarely depict things like, like church going. And there were other kind of reoccurring, persistent absences in advertising. Absences involving the sort of social realities of people that were just not there. So religious services, like I said, um, factory settings, industrialized work settings, right? In the 20s and 30s, uh, many people, probably the majority of workers in certain industrial centers in large cities would have worked in large industrial workplaces like a factory. And yet you rarely see those types of workplaces depicted in, in advertising. And similarly, he found that uh, when you had a depiction of a person's home, rarely would you see one that would have been like a working class person's home. In fact, most of the time, these homes would have been kind of middle or upper class homes, even for products that would have been targeted to working class people, right? So it's not even a case of actually trying to sort of show people what they themselves might recognize in the ad in terms of a home that might look like their own. There was a case that advertisers were always trying to aspirationally represent the home life in terms of what someone might aspire to want in a home and not necessarily accurately depict what they would already have in their home. And similarly, in terms of things like what kind of sporting or cultural events you might show, um, one of the things he found was that uh, if you were to look at the social reality at this time, a lot of Americans would have followed boxing. They uh, would have gone to boxing matches and followed very closely the careers of certain boxers. That's a, a sport that was rarely depicted in advertising. Hey, it's a working class sport. 
You don't see it depicted in advertising. What do you see more often depicted in advertising? Sports like tennis and golf, which were rarely played by ordinary people, but were something that were aspirationally represented as something that people could you know, aspire to down the road, so to speak, if they were to uh, want to move up in terms of their class or socioeconomic standing. Okay, so those are, we want to look at what's, with advertisements, you, you want to see what's there, but you want to see also what's not there on a persistent basis, right? And what is um, uh, regularly being omitted from depictions of ordinary lives. Now, let's take this um, next point here, which is the question that, uh, Marshan grapples with, and, and even people like me grapple with as a scholar of advertising, to try and think about this, this problem of social reflection, right? So one of the things when you look at historical ads or historical plays or films or novels or whatever, you're trying to get a sense of how helpful those sources are for depicting what the lives of people would have been like in that historical time period, right? And so uh, the question is, like, how, would, how, how do ads work in that sense? Are they, are they better or worse than, say, understanding past American experience or past Canadian experience by understanding what kind of films they watched or what kind of novels they read, that sort of thing? And what Marchand sort of comes up with is basically saying ads can be actually pretty good for that as long as you understand the biases, right? Like you understand what's being neglected. Uh, what's not being represented, and then ads can help you in some respects in that way. So if you were to think about um, uh, those other examples I have here, like a film or a novel or a play, uh, those things actually usually come out of the imaginative kind of work of an artist, right? Whether it's a playwright or whether it's a, an author. And that author is not necessarily thinking what I depict in this play, uh, it's not necessarily thinking that it has to be somehow an accurate social reflection of society around him or her as, as a, in general. Rather, it's just the work of an imaginative kind of thinker, right? And they come up with characters and they come up with a storyline that reflects that. Now, in some ways, it probably intersects with their social life, but it doesn't have to necessarily do it in every instance in terms of the way the story is told, right? So in that sense, um, there may be some limitations in terms of how well a film or a novel or a play can tell us what the social reality was for a given time period. In some respects, advertising may be a bit better, right? There are biases, but advertising has a couple things going for it. For one, it's a commercial art, okay? And by that, I mean that the way that advertising gets produced is not just through some artist advertiser who decides to put out a bunch of ads and sort of see what people think of it or something like that, the way it might work if you were a novelist or whatever. No, advertising gets produced through a commercial process, right? There's a client, let's say it's Kellogg's, they deal with an ad agency, they have an idea for what they want to communicate in their advertising, they have a sense of where, um, the, what types of uh, consumers or people they want to appeal to, they want to connect with those people, etc. So in that sense, because it is a commercial art form, it is very one that's um, very one very one that is very much geared towards ensuring that kind of connection with ordinary people that would exist in that society. If it's say for a product like like cereal, which was fairly widely consumed, so effective advertising is trying to connect with people. It's trying to reach out. It's trying to make them pay attention. It's also though, in some ways, a lot of it was very much. Um, tapping into the values that people would have, their sense of beliefs, their values, what they, their customs, what, what they really felt was important about themselves, maybe even their lifestyle. And in that sense, advertising is trying to reflect what's out there to a certain degree. And um, in, in that sense, you would want to think about um, advertising as, as probably a, a better um, vehicle or better form of popular art for helping us understand what past societies were. As long as you can use, you understand the kind of biases that would go into making ads. And we'll be talking more about those as, as we as we move along. Uh, it's 
it is an aspirational art though, right? I mean, it's in some ways, it, it's often depicting people in terms of their better selves, the way they really would wish themselves to be or what they aspire to being. And in that sense, it can be really helpful in terms of understanding those types of values, right? Where people really aspire to, where they would want to become in their lives. Okay, so here's one aspect of the, uh, the way bias is engendered in advertising. And it's the term that um, uh, Marshen calls the, the Zerspiegel. And that's a, a German word for uh, a type of mirror that you might see in a fun house or a carnival. Uh, it's a mirror that purposely distorts what it represents. So you can see here the example of, this, of the image on the top here. A woman is in a fun house. Uh, she's in front of the mirror and it portrays her as maybe being three feet tall or something like that. So that's an example of the distortion effect, right? The mirror is designed not to give an accurate uh, reflection of what she looks like. It's purposely designed to distort and give you that kind of portrayal. Now, uh, Marchand basically says that advertising has that kind of Zer Spiegel effect. There are some things, if you were to look at that woman and, um, and their image, uh, if you were to look at that and go, and if you could only see the image on the mirror, um, you might think, wow, this is a society where everyone is three feet tall or something, or at least all the women are. And in fact, as long as you know that the mirror works to distort that way, and you can correct for that bias or understand that angle of refraction in the mirror, then you can say to yourself, well, actually, no, we know that that woman is really five feet five, let's say. And that's the only aspect of distortion. In fact, the hair color is the same. The fabric of the dress is the same. Uh, the shoes are the same. So there are ways you can look at that mirrored representation and, and try to determine what's the, where the distortions are and where they're not, right? And try to understand where they actually might be fairly accurate in terms of depicting society. So these types of mirrors, the Zerspiegel, is important for two things, right? It both selects in the sense of who gets in front of the Zerspiegel, right? So the advertising um, artists or the ad makers, they choose what goes into the ad, but then um, they also then may distort how they portray those people or those things or whatever in the ad, right? So it's both the realm of selection, what gets in the ad, and then how you may distort the portrayal of someone or something in the ad to reflect something that may not mirror social reality. Now, what we'll um, talk about initially in terms of one aspect of distortion uh, and the kind of bias that goes into that, it just involves the composition of the ad makers, of the people working in ad agencies and even those who are doing advertising and marketing uh, who actually work in the large companies like Kellogg's uh, and the Procter & Gamble and the rest. But primarily ad agency people is what we're going to be focused on here. So the question to ask yourself, well, who were these people primarily? And, and what kind of um, philosophy or thinking did they have with respect to their role uh, as advertisers? and what um, relationship did they feel that they had to broader society. So in the first instance, who were these people? They were primarily men, uh, uh, well over, probably over 90% of the people working in the 20s and 30s in ad agencies were men. The ad agencies were primarily based in New York. In the case of, of Canada, it would have been Toronto and Montreal. So uh, they're primarily in the large cities like New York they're primarily men. Uh, many of them would have gone to uh, college and university. They would have not studied advertising because you wouldn't be able to study advertising then. It wasn't in post-secondary uh, schools as such. Um, they would have gone to elite colleges usually, uh, Ivy League kind of places, University of Chicago kind of places. They often either came from kind of urban backgrounds or they, as soon as they finished college, they went to live in cities. So they were primarily uh, oriented to sort of city life as opposed to small town or rural life. 
Um, as I said, about at least 90% are male, certainly even at the senior, senior levels, like the account executives, they're virtually all male. Where you see some women working in ad agencies is at the level of copywriters. Uh, and in some cases, that's just because, as we talked about last week, there were um, there was a sense that about 80% of consumption was done by women. And so some of the ad agencies thought it was a good idea to have a woman or two in the uh, in the agency who might work as a copywriter, who could give them some perspective on the so-called female mind or something. So these were um, these were people, these were not regular ordinary people, right? They were kind of an elite within, uh, within American society. These were people that may have gone to university, studied English or history, topics like that. Uh, maybe they had a propensity for writing um, some of them were even sort of writing novels on the side, that sort of thing. But they had a sort of a, you know, way with words, and they managed to get jobs in ad agencies where they could put their writing skills to, to use in that sense. Now, um, these, um, these men had also a notion of uh, public service or what um, Marchan would, would call um, cultural uplift. And that means that they, they, on the one hand, they worked for their clients and their clients would give them direction in terms of what they wanted from a marketing campaign. And, and so they, they worked in that. I mean, it's, a, it's commercial art, right? You work in a commercial system. You're not on your own to produce whatever ads you want. But they also had this idea about public service and cultural uplift in the sense that they were going to work for a client, but they also wanted their work to sort of raise or elevate ordinary people or the masses, right? And so in their mind, if they were to depict um, a setting that say was an image of someone at an opera, and, and they might say, be able to convince the, the, um, the client that this would sort of be a good type of um, use of art or imagery for the ad, and, their, and maybe the client would say, okay, fine, that looks good. Um, in their mind, it was also a case of, well, that's also helping to kind of educate ordinary people. Even if the people that'll see this ad are not currently opera goers, and most of them would not have been, all right, they would have more likely gone to baseball games or something like that. Um, the idea was that you were kind of educating people as to what they should think about aspiring to, because those, you know, the people that they hung out with went to opera, right? The people that they hung out with played golf. Uh, they played tennis. They did not go to boxing matches. And so there was this idea that you could provide cultural uplift for ordinary people in terms of what you depicted in advertisements that would give people a sense of what they could aspire to if they wanted to become solidly middle class or even upper middle class or even upper class, both in a kind of economic sense, but also in a cultural sense as well. Now, Marchand calls these men the apostles of modernity. So what does he mean by that? Well, if you um, have even minimal familiarity with, uh, let's say, the Bible, or the New Testament, you'll know that um, the original apostles were the people um, like John the Baptist and others that, that basically after Christ died, say 2,000 years ago, um, these were the, they were all men, these were the men who were uh, either you know, knew Christ or worked, been with him or afterwards learned about him. And they were the initial ones that started to spread the word about Christ after his death. So in those dozens of years or so afterwards, was sort of literally traveling through parts of the Middle East, sort of talking about Christ and about about the sort of religious thinking that would have been would be well, that would become the basis of Christianity, right? So those were the original apostles, and they were promoting Christ's vision. Um, and and so Marchand says, well, there were these ad people were kind of like apostles of modernity, but it's not just about promoting only the modern and the new and the, what's sort of the new as 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 uh, technological change or the new in terms of style or design or new new kind of products, whatever. It was promoting that, but it was also um, situating that kind of embrace of the new 
with something else. And and that's something else. Actually, I want to I'll kind of go over this first and then I'll um I'll talk about the something else after, right? So modern change and how people can adapt to that change. And I want to illustrate this with um with two ads here. And you can see that in some ways these ads are very similar. They they're both car ads. They're both from r roughly around 1930, uh, so same time period. You can see that um, they have a comparable amount of text in each. I mean, obviously the one on the left has more text, but um, there's a fair bit of text on the one on the right too. And the car, uh, I mean, look at the placement. It's basically kind of cars are both placed in the same spot in the ad. And um, the company names at the bottom, text is in the middle. Etc. So on some level, you could say that these are pretty similar kinds of ads. On another level, another level though, I would say they're very different in terms of the way they they promote a sense of the modern and the new, and how you should aspire to embracing that. So if you look at the car on the left, the Pontiac, it's a conventional product as information ad. Essentially, you have a picture of the of the product, the car, the Pontiac. Um, and then you have uh, uh, a lot of text, which mostly is just giving you product information about the car, right? You know, the, the, the cubic inch L head engines, I'm trying to read what some of the stuff says, the, the harmonic balancer, uh, the cross flow radiator, etc. Just basic information about what the, um, the product attributes are of that vehicle. All right. Now, we've seen that kind of ad before. I've talked about the product is information ad. You would have seen these, these types of ads going back to the 1800s. Basically, you just show the product, you put up a lot of text about it. There's nothing really modern about this, right? It doesn't really sort of give you a sense of you're trying to embrace something new or, or something that's going to take you into a, almost a different kind of cultural place. And that's different from the ad on the right. And that's the Franklin car ad. And you can see here, um, for one, it's in color. Now that is not the only reason why it's a more compelling ad, but um, color becomes a commonplace thing in advertising in magazines. Um, and, and certainly by the 20s and 30s, you're seeing lots of color advertisements. But I think what's compelling about this uh, in terms of this embrace of modernity, as opposed to just selling a car, is the way the ad communicates here and the use of, um, of the imagery, especially to do that. But let's just focus a little bit on the, uh, what the text is in, in the Franklin ad. It, you can see here, um, I'm just gonna read you a couple of things about the, the revolutionary performance. Um, youth and all those who recognize progress have enthusiastically accepted the new Franklin as the greatest motoring advance in years. And it, the text is, um, some of it's kind of merely descriptive, but some of it also does things like as you drive, you sense the feel of driving an airplane, right? It's a kind of, almost a surreal kind of experience as opposed to the humdrum of just driving a car. So the text sort of aligns with this kind of um, embrace of something beyond just the mere material features of the car. And you can look at the way that the imagery is presented here. Um, the car is depicted there, but the visual sort of centerpiece of the ad is not the car. It's this woman who is standing out there. And, and in fact, with her arms stretched out like that, is sort of embracing almost like she's flying, right? That she could sort of take off uh, in that sense. She's not the protagonist of the ad in the sense that you're not supposed to look at her and identify with her. And for part, for one reason that cars still, it was one of those product sectors of the few that were still primarily male oriented in terms of who um, the intended consumers were. So the protagonist is more likely to be one you can identify with in, in the ad is more likely to be the guy sitting in the car. The woman is symbolically represented as a kind of feeling, right? And even the uh, ad in the subheading says, youth welcomes air cooling motoring and the airplane feel of the brilliant Franklin. And she's representing this sort of feeling of, of liberation, of freedom, of, 
of almost being able to fly away in that sense. And so here you have a, a kind of modern notion about what the car represents. It's not just a thing that carries you around. It represents freedom. It represents otherworldly kind of things, right? Of getting away from the mundane, the ordinary circumstances of your life and actually becoming emancipated or liberated in that sense, right? Those meanings are, are far richer than the meanings for the car ad on the left, the Pontiac. So in that sense, this ad works for, to, to enable people to embrace a form of modernity, right? Which is this idea that products, in this case, this car, can kind of change you, right? Can make you think differently and can kind of motivate you into a kind of embrace of feelings and attachments and sentiments around products that may not, well, can't really exist without the advertising. Okay, so I wanna just carry this theme a little further and with another point that Marshan makes uh, in this theme. And it's the idea of the, the advertiser is this apostle of modernity. So that's what I was just sort of showing in the last slide, right? Um, getting people to, um, want to embrace the new, this new technology, this new car, and the excitement that would go with it and the sense of new feelings that it can engender in you. But what they found, what these advertisers found was that people sometimes were reluctant to sort of fully embrace the new, the modern, and that there was a sense of anxiety that they experienced with some of these types of embraces that were, were called upon them. And so what Marchand argues is that advertisers then kind of came up with a way to sort of sell the new while also assuaging the anxieties or lessening the anxieties that people might have about embracing the new. And that could be a sense of the anxieties you might feel involving, say, a loss of community, a loss of individual control. Um, he, and I'm just going to give you some of the quotes that um, come from the Marchand text that um, people might be willing to embrace the benefits of modernity, and that could be the technological benefits, for example. But they may resent some aspects of modern society as a whole, right? They may resent what he calls the indignities of scale. The indignities of scale, this idea about everything's bigger now and everything's more complex and it's more bureaucratized and these, these sorts of things. So they, they were reluctant to engage with that. They may want the, the actual tech benefits, but they may also see other things about that that uh, produces some concern. Um, the, the buffer uh, offering a de uh, the, the de uh, buffer against the dehumanizing scale of the industrial, the mass society, and some aspects of modernity. So the advertisers could introduce people to modern products in ways that, as he wrote, gave the appearance and feel of a personal relationship with those same products um, within the, their, their own kind of compass of, of their own human scale. So if, if people wanted to enjoy the, and here I'm quoting Marchand, if people wanted to enjoy the benefits of modern technology without relinquishing any of the emotional satisfactions of a simpler life, Advertising would attempt to give them what they wanted. So um, he calls that the, the therapeutics of advertising, right? And I've got this ad here, which I believe illustrates this concept. So if you um, see, this is an ad for the Santa Fe Railway. But in particular, it's it's an ad for a type of dining service that they're introducing on this railway. Um, it's a kind of fine dining service that you can have on this train for the, I guess, the longer train trips. And some of the text in here um, references uh, courteous service, um, shining silverware, and linens as white as the snow of the Rockies, right? So it's saying that it's a kind of high uh, highfalutin kind of nice highbrow kind of dining experience that you can have on the train. Now, what's interesting about the ad is that it doesn't just like, it doesn't even show you what the inside of the train looks like, right? 
It doesn't give you a depiction of what that advertise, sorry, what that dining experience is like. In fact, the ad shows you almost nothing of that. It's just the, the window shot that you see of a few people inside being served. The foreground of the ad is actually two individuals, the man and presumably his son, who don't really look at all like the kind of people that you would see in that dining car. He's dressed, and they're both dressed in kind of cowboy gear, uh, you know, boots and jeans and vests and cowboy hats and the rest. And, and they represent a kind of traditional American folk, right? These are the kind of, you know, people living on the farm or living in kind of ranching setting. Uh, they're not the big city people that presumably might be the regular users of this dining car or whatever. And, that, and yet they're passing a kind of endorsement on that by saying, gee, that's, that's eaten, right? Or in other words, they're saying that's, that's really good eaten. And in that sense, when you look at this ad, you can think, well, I mean, let's say you're trying to advertise this dining service at a time, it's 1940s, right? When relatively few people eat out regularly, it's nowhere near the level as it is today, right? Eating out in restaurants was far less common then. And eating on a train would have been far less, less common. And then having like fine dining on a train would have seemed kind of almost alien for, for many people, right? How do you move people towards that kind of modern change? It just may not be something that they would be willing to embrace or they might think it's um, just something that's not suited to them. And the way that you can get at that or to sort of deal with the anxiety that that might produce in people is that you depict people like these two characters here in the ad basically endorsing it, right? And they're kind of endorsing it from a perspective that you might identify with more, right? A sense of, you know, community and the kind of people that you are a part of. Um, so do you think of yourself as being an ordinary person or down home? You don't even have to be a cowboy in that sense, but you could see yourself as a kind of ordinary American that's not really accustomed to this type of dining experience. And the use of those two characters would, would make it more um, friendly uh, and it wouldn't be as anxiety producing in terms of whether you feel that you're kind of giving up on home cooking or other kind of uh, things that you think are valuable about eating food in a different way. All right, so that's that's the, uh, the the therapeutics of advertising, right? It's both, uh, you know, embrace of the new and the modern, these apostles of modernity, but they're going to act as a buffer against some of the difficult aspects of that, some of the um, anxiety-producing aspects of that on the part of uh, people. Okay, so what I want you um, for to do for class on Tuesday is uh, I've got four ads here I want you to look at, and they're all from the last uh, decade or so. And they all embody aspects of what I've just been talking about, the, the therapeutics. It's in, in virtually every, every case here, it's a relatively new product, and they're almost all tech products here, I believe. Um, so like Skype, uh, when it was introduced around that time, 2013, uh, the Kindle, reading books in Kindle format as opposed to on paper. And then here's an iPhone ad from 2013 <clears throat> and a Facebook ad from 2012, sort of when these products were becoming very popular. They, they all embody aspects of what I've just been talking about. And what I want you to do for class is just to tell me what they are, okay? How do they involve the therapeutics of advertising, right? It's both the product that's new and modern, but it also deals with the anxieties that people might have about embracing that form of technical modernity. Okay. All right. So what you um, are seeing during this time, a uh, fairly common way, is um, it are ways that advertising tries to introduce uh, new products within a, a, a framework that is familiar to people, right? So in this case, um, it's a, a new shaving cartridge, uh, which would have been very different from how people traditionally shave, which would have been, let's say, with a straight razor or just using shaving cream. This is a kind of cartridge thing that you can insert and use that way. 
And so the way that they illustrate that in this ad is through uh, approximating the experience that many people would have already had with in terms of putting um, cartridges into a gun, right? So in that sense, there's a kind of personal tone, if you actually read the ad, and I'm not going to, a personal tone that kind of works at the personal references that people have and appealing to people um, in a more personal way with references that they're already familiar with. And here the, the advertiser is um, also more and more presenting itself as a wise counsel or a wise counselor. And that in part has to do with that idea we talked about before about the cult sense of cultural uplift. Like cultural uplift is an idea that if you present certain kinds of aspects of cultural life, say the opera, and then you get people more familiarized with that and they may want to aspire to that. And in this case, it's more kind of directly dealing with social changes that people might find themselves in. We've talked in this course about how people living in rural areas moving to cities and there's just a whole bunch of new things they may have to buy in that context that they wouldn't have had to buy in the rural area because they may have made their own clothes then or they may have grow their, grown their own food. So you've got this sense that not only are there more things you need to buy, but when you're in a city, you're encountering more people, more social cir circumstances, more social situations. It can be anxiety producing, right? And so the advertisers in this context are increasingly presenting themselves as a kind of um, a kind of coach or offering helpful advice or just helping people fit in better in terms of these, nozzles, uh, these uh, social circumstances that they find themselves in. Um, and here's uh, one example of this. And you start, like this is a, a very common theme in um, sanitary product advertising, which um, actually is a new product in the 1920s. Um, so prior to this, the um, sanitary napkins were not available to women, or at least not in as a kind of manufactured product like like Kotex here. And so you see this kind of wise counselor role taking place in this genre of advertising. And some of you, if you're um, have already contacted me, you might do your essay on on this genre of advertising in the 20s and 30s, and you will certainly see more examples of this type of advertising, right? So again, it's it's a portrayal of advertisers, not just as these people that are just trying to make a buck and just trying to do whatever um, ads that their client wants. In some cases, some of these men feel that what they're doing has a kind of public service aspect to it by educating and helping people. Um, this, this area too also links with what we talked about with Lydia Pinkham in the sense that there was a fair bit of social stigma and secrecy surrounding women's menstruation, right? And then whenever that happens, it presents an opportunity for some party to sort of come in and say, well, we can help you here, right? You're not going to get this help necessarily from maybe other people in your lives. So the advertising can help in terms of saying we're going to provide advice and offer you some kind of solution to a problem you might have. Okay, so I think uh, we're going to leave it. We'll leave it here and I'll come back and we'll talk about Listerine, which was an iconic and very important advertiser in the 1920s. All right, see you soon.